Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's broadcast. My name is Nicole Erdix, and I'm creator of the online resource, The Inclusive Class, which is a resource for teachers and parents regarding inclusive education. Today, I'm pleased to present this webinar with four experts in the field of inclusive education, and we are going to talk about ways in which you can include students who have various uh, differences, disabilities, special needs, um, any type of extra need that you feel needs support in the classroom. So what we are going to do is um, a roundtable type presentation where I will go through and have each presenter talk about a uh, profile, perhaps a typical profile of a student that you might come across in your classroom. And then they will talk about some strategies and tips for providing inclusive academic, social, and emotional opportunities for that student. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our presenters. And then after we do our introductions, we'll get started. Uh, before I do the introductions, though, I want to remind you that this broadcast will be recorded. And you can find the recording at YouTube underneath the Inclusive Class. And it will also be on theinclusiveclass.com. So you can go back and have a look at it later. So uh, also to get your pens and pencils and notebooks ready, because you're going to be wanting to, to take notes during this session. So lots of information coming your way. Anyway, uh, so to begin with, we have uh, Antonia Hurston here with us today. She is one of our presenters joining us. Hi, Antonia. Hi. Thank you for joining us. And we also have Beth Foraker. Hello, Beth. Hi, guys. And we have Renee Marquez. Hello. And we've got Shelly Moore. Hi, Shelly. Hello from Canada. Woohoo! Go Canada. Um, so I, I've got your profiles up on my website at theinclusiveclass.com. So if anybody would like to know your backgrounds and where you're from and what you're doing and how to contact you, they can go to theinclusiveclass.com and find out more information because I'd love to spend um, as much time as we can just throwing out tips, strategies, ideas uh, for, for students, to help students in the classroom. So let's start with Antonia. Um, Antonia, do you want to begin by describing uh, perhaps a student that somebody might see in a classroom and ways in which we can include that student? Absolutely. So I'm going to start with a student who has cerebral palsy, uh, is vocal about their wants and needs, and is about seven to eight years behind classmates in their ability to attend to the general class material, just the, the general curriculum that would be taught in a general ed class every day. This is a student that really cares about, we'll say, her classmates, and it's a student that follows her schedule independently. So just you start school in a couple weeks, or I know in some places tomorrow, uh, what do you do if you have this student in your general ed class? How can you kind of meet her needs? So one thing that, you know, I really thought about when I kind of looked at the profile of that student is that this is a student that's vocal about her wants and needs, so the first thing to do is to talk to her about it. And in my mind, this was a student maybe in the early um, kind of middle school or junior high years, maybe in seventh or eighth grade. So it really would be appropriate as the teacher to find some time to talk to her and to say, you know, how are you feeling? You know, what are you excited about this year? Maybe what are you nervous about? How are some, some ways that you, you know, really felt great in, in school last year? How are some, some ways that maybe you didn't feel as good or, or you feel like things weren't as great? You know, keep it positive. But if they're able to tell you, then that's the best first place to start, especially with a with a kid in junior high. And then from there, I would say, you know, of course, also work with their parents, talk to former teachers, um, former paraeducators as well. You know, if you're just trying to get a picture of, of what worked and what didn't work uh, last year so that you don't kind of have to reinvent the wheel this year. So that's, you know, kind of the first thing always, I think, is to listen. And then the second thing is to start to think about how to structure your curriculum and how to modify your curriculum. And I'll start with kind of structuring because one thing that's really helpful to do in a general ed class is to think about how you can how you can teach and how you can structure all of your assignments and all of your curriculum 
so that you're doing something for the whole class that's meeting the needs of each specific student. And that's often called universal de design for learning. It's, it's kind of in that philosophy, which is a philosophy that it just blew my mind when I learned about it in school because I, it made so much sense to me and I could already see places that it's utilized in the world. And, and the idea is really that we design things, we design structures and sidewalks and curriculums so that they are able to meet the needs of as many people as possible right off the bat. And so that we're really able to meet each student where they are and and it's nice because I think with Common Core now there's even more opportunities in some school sites to have diversified learning if you have that in your school and and to really teach in ways that that pay attention um, or are mindful of each student's needs and providing different opportunities kind of different modalities for each student and I'm sure um, you guys have a, a lot to say that's pretty basic um, the next thing that I would talk about is when you think about modifying curriculum, since this student is so peer oriented, I would spend a lot of time thinking about how do I modify the curriculum in ways that don't make this student feel different, that don't make this student feel like they're not doing the same things as their student as the other students in the class as their friends. And so you know really paying attention to how can we take, what might be a more complex assignment and keep the, the core of the assignment the same as the other students both in terms of curriculum and in terms of you know generally what what you're going to be asking them to do so for example if you were asking people everyone in the class to write a five paragraph essay you know can you can you still have a writing project for this student but find ways to modify in there so find ways to can they type instead of write or can they write instead of type whatever works could they tell you the information verbally could they um, could if they if you know if writing is challenging and if writing's not one of the goals and maybe not even really one of the goals of what you're doing if maybe you're talking about um, you know you're you're trying to get a project that assesses learning broadly maybe a book report but you want to take you know, are, are you really looking for writing? Are you looking for the information to know that the student comprehended? What are some other ways that the student can, can um, kind of give you that information? Could they do an oral report? Could they draw a picture? Could they work with other students in the class um, to come up with, with something there? So I'm, I'm definitely interested. I feel like I'm going on and on if you guys have things that you'd like to, to pop in with. Um, but I thought that that was you know, just kind of important to talk a little bit since I was the first off about, you know, generally what modification is and how to, to do that. Um, you know, I would also say for a student with cerebral palsy, just some things to keep in mind. Um, always with group projects, if possible, have different modalities within the project so that this student can, you know, can work with their peers and can have a place and that will allow all the other students to have a place too. So maybe they're doing a project that involves some writing, it involves some presenting, some speaking, it involves a visual component. And you know, if, if you can find students that kind of are interested in doing each of those different pieces, then they can each do something they feel comfortable with and your student with cerebral palsy also could, you know, could have an access point there. Um, I would also say that if you're doing a lot of note taking in class, you know, be very mindful of um, perhaps having a note taker for your student that might not be where you want your student to be using all of their energy and it might also be a great way to work with the peer so that um, you know they can kind of have a peer relationship they can have someone um, who you know maybe is very adept at note taking and you can say do you feel comfortable taking notes could we make a copy of your notes for this other student that lets the kind of note taker student feel like they're having a role and they're having um, you know a special a special helpful thing they get to do in the class and probably helps their own note taking as well and it helps the student with a disability not have to use their energy in, in that way um, and it can also be helpful if if they're taking those notes home for their parents to see you know for other people that are helping them learn for their for their paraeducators for maybe their resource teacher if they have a study skills or a resource time to get to see those notes as well so that's something that I would uh, certainly recommend and then also just with these students to keep in mind fatigue in general and how can you 
you know, really kind of build in some some easy easy uh, structures in the day that will help them not to get fatigued um, as the day goes on. So, you know, a very simple example of that would be two sets of books: a book, a set of book to keep books to keep at home and a set of books to have in the classroom so that they're not carrying the books on their back all day, that can just make a big difference in terms of the amount of fatigue that they feel and in terms of the fatigue that they might feel in terms of having to organize supplies. Um, any supplies that you can have easily on hand for them so that they just don't have to have um, the added concern if it's not one of their IEP goals to, to be um, you know, kind of maintaining their own set of school supplies and for some kids that might be a goal but if that's not one of their goals then maybe that's an easy way that you can have some things for them in their classroom so that they're not having to worry about getting having that at home and having that at school uh, and um, you know certainly certainly just you know also paying attention to other resources that might come with your textbooks large print textbooks audio books things like that um, those should be readily available to anyone and can make a huge difference in terms of allowing a student who feels, you know, overwhelmed or who fatigues easily or who needs some extra structures to feel like they're getting the same information and you do want them to get the same information as the other students, but they're getting it in a way that's not as exhausting. So maybe your student can read, but reading for them is very tiring, then they could listen to an audio book and maintain some of their energies for other things. So that was my thought on those. Great. Great. So I don't know if you guys have anything to add. Any experiences? Yeah. Does anybody have anything to add? Pictures that has Well, I have one more thing to add. <laughs> one thing that I did just think of is I did want to talk a little bit about assessment and just the idea. Some of the things that I'll be saying, I read a very interesting article while I was preparing for this by David Rose, who's out of Harvard, and he was, I know, I'm a big fan too, so I, I went back to, back to the, the books and the articles. Um, he is, you know, really the grandfather, the founder of Universal Design for Learning. So some of the things you'll hear are things um, you know, that are in my head from reading his work, like the idea of, you know, when, you, when you're having a student write a book report, is that because you're gauging their comprehension of the text or is it because you're gauging their writing? And if it's because you're gauge, gauging their comprehension of the text, maybe they can tell you the comprehension of the text. And it's because if it's because you're gauging their writing, well, maybe they can write a smaller amount than other students. But just being really mindful of that. And then also, uh, his work reminded me to be really mindful in assessment and to make sure, you know, to, to pay attention to how you're assessing students so that you don't have a student that's maybe, you know, going to be working maybe even on modified assignments and then you never want them to face the same test that other students might be facing. You really want to be assessing your student throughout the learning process to make sure that they're picking up the information throughout the learning process and then just being mindful when test time does come of the best way to assess their learning and that's you know probably if they're if they're far behind their general ed peers that's not going to be taking the same test as as the other peers it's going to be you know maybe working with a paraeducator and having a verbal test maybe having a shortened test that really boils down to the fundam to the fundamentals of the curriculum shorter questions shorter expected answers multiple choice that kind of thing Good reminder, thank you, especially when it comes down to assessment in schools and classrooms and districts that are high stakes uh, testing environments. Yeah. It's really important to remember that there are, if necessary and if needed, there are modifications that can be made or even mm -hmm. accommodations for that testing situation. Yeah, I think so. And then to move on, just I had um, one more student that I wanted to talk a little bit about, and that was would be a student maybe. Um, with a specific learning disability or a language impairment, um, you know, also a junior high student. But I thought it would be interesting to think about how it contrasts when they're when your student is also very peer oriented, like the student we just talked about, but has some work refusal. You know, the student we just talked about, you know, in my head was engaged with peers, liked their peers, the peers were happy to help them, and and they, you know, were motivated to do their academic work. But what do you do when you have a student? who doesn't seem motivated to do their academic work and is very engaged with peers and maybe um, is refusing to do work and, and you might think that maybe that work refusal is coming from not wanting to be 
judged, not wanting to seem like they don't you know, like they don't know the material, not wanting to be seen working with a paraeducator. I was a paraeducator for years, so I certainly had that experience. Um, you know, what do you do in that situation? And, you know, what worked for me, not everything worked for me, but what worked for me um, was, you know, a lot of the same things that we just talked about. So, you know, really focusing with, uh, with students with work refusal on the multiple modalities really focusing on, okay, if, you, if you're not going to write an essay for me, could you draw me a picture? Could you do an art project? Could you make a video? Could you do a skit? You know, really looking at what is the goal of the lesson that I'm trying to teach? What's the curriculum that I want to know that this child has grasped? And what are the many different ways that I can allow them and, and allow everyone in the class to access that as well? So what are the ways, you know, if, if, if it doesn't matter if they do a poster board or if they give a speech, you know, if, if, if you're just looking for, you know, their connection maybe to a text that you've read or their understanding of a historical event, looking at different ways because you may find that these kids that have some work refusal, you may find that it comes from them being overwhelmed and it, you may find that it comes from them you know, needing to have a little bit more of a sense of control over their environment, probably because they feel out of control in the academic environment in some way. And so, you know, giving more and more choices and letting them really harness their own unique skills can be helpful. And it can also be helpful in terms of them, you know, feeling like they're being represented to their friends in the way that they want to be represented. So if a student identifies as an artist, really harness that because one, you know, they, they might already be comfortable with their, with their friends knowing that they're an artist. So if you can harness that, that might be really helpful. Um, and then it can also be really helpful in those situations to do group projects so that, you know, instead of pulling students away from their peers in order to try to get them to work and maybe stop chatting, you can have them work with their peers, work on a project together, and once again, have a project that has multiple methods, multiple modalities, multiple pieces, so that each student can really self-select into the piece that feels right to them. Thank and you, Antonia. I'm sorry to go through, and I know that there's um, much more that, that you can Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm totally happy to move <laughs> on, but thank you. No, I, I would love to hear more if you want to share it with, um, with, with me on my Facebook page, or if you'd like to email it, then I can share it out with other people. Uh, those are great suggestions, and it's not something we often hear specific strategies for, so thank you very much. Absolutely. And uh, now we have Beth Foraker, who is going to talk with us about another type of student that you might have or will have in your classroom and ways in which you can support uh, the student that Beth is going to talk about. Hi, Beth. Do we hear Beth? No. No. Okay, why don't we move over to Renee, and then maybe while Renee is speaking, Beth can get her, let's see, her mic going. Or is she going to try again? She might. Okay. Well, Renee, do you want to go ahead, and then we'll see, see if Beth can get hers up and running in a bit? Nope, nothing. Well, okay. Renee, you're on. I'm on. Okay. Well, the student I ended up uh, I ended up putting a profile on, and I want to be clear. Even though we've had a lot of experience for all of us with different profiles of students, uh, they're not specific to. Uh, we're trying to be as general as possible. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Uh. So the student I have is another student with cerebral palsy, but uses an AAC and requires the use of a wheelchair. Um. And is pro uh, I would consider proficient with an AAC. Uses three or four different devices and different means to communicate. Um, and it can also it re regularly type sentences. Um, and will provide and will uh, communicate uh, quite willingly with anyone as they go through. And they go through their day. Um, and the the thing I really really notice is particularly with students with the AAC, they they come with a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And 
which is great at the elementary school level. Like you can carve out a space for them and make sure that they can get into their desk. Um, but the biggest thing is that all of that stuff does still create a, a physical barrier in the classroom. And it's, uh, it's hard. Yay, you're back, Beth! It worked? It worked? Yes, it worked. Okay, good. All right, keep going, Renee. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, and, uh, and in junior high, where, in junior high and high school, where it's all of, about packing stuff in and moving it out, every single class is very different in the amount of space that the student can, uh, can utilize. I mean, desk sizes vary. Um, and again, uh, as a barrier, the screens being up, the teachers may not actually know that the student is, is trying to process something or is currently typing a sentence to, to, have, to have the devices read for them. And uh, this is where I'd say that teachers need to have a, a little bit more patience and uh, willingness to wait. Maybe preloading a student with a, a question so that, that they know that the student might possibly want to answer later, so they can provide the, uh, so they can spend the time to create their answer and provide it to the class when it's appropriate. Um, the AAC needs to be also primed for classes, especially setting specific tabs for um, by class. So I, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many test tubes I talk about in history class, unless it's the founding of the <laughs> test tube. Um, I try. Uh, so all of the, you spent, you have to invest in the time to get the AAC, the vocabulary that's necessary for the class. You have to spend the time to look at the barriers that are physically just around the student, making sure the student can get into the classroom and, um, and access all the rest of the classroom. If we are doing a, a, a uh, come over here and look at this, uh, this, thing, this demonstration the teacher is doing, that means all of the stuff that the student is working on has to you know, back away, make sure that there's a clear path to, to that demonstration. And so that was my student in general. Um, does anyone have any other suge um, suggestions or with regards to AAC yeah. specifically? Yeah, or students who, who who use them or uh, limited mobility. Well, I think um, making cool nicknames with the AAC to create some social connections. Can you guys hear me? Is yeah, yeah. <laughs> so cool nicknames for friends or people in class or teachers or part you know, any faculty member would be a great way to build some bridges um, with somebody with an AAC. Yeah. Like Sea yeah. Dog or you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> funny nicknames too. Because usually people with AAC have hilarious senses of humor. Um, they've developed them over time. So they, I'm sure getting them to create some good nicknames would be uh, fun, a fun class, yeah. class yeah. practice. And I, I've heard from just in general, having the students use some of the language that other students are using. So um, not necessarily all of, like you said, Beth, the, the nicknames, and I'm thinking maybe slang words as well, yes. that yeah. other kids are using in the school, and keeping that vocabulary current so that the student can relate. Um, I'm also to, reminded of, uh, of electricity and making sure that they have access to speakers. Uh, hallways are horrible places for some of the, some devices. It's just not. It's not. You're not able to hear them as well as clearly as you would be in a classroom. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. I just found out about this cool thing called vocal ID that this woman is working on to create every person's unique voice, and everybody can. Um, it's like 500 hours is needed to create these voices, and they they synthesize all the donors' voices to create as close as they can to the person's voice. So mm. that would be something super cool that um, the class could participate in and get extra credit if you wanted to create a vocal ID um, account and start doing it. Literally what you do, it comes up on the screen and it's little short sentences you read and they take your voice and put it into their donor bank to create voices. So mm -hmm. just making people aware of what it's like to not have a real physical voice and to be using AAC um, would be massive for junior high kids or anybody. Yeah, good to know. And I think it's important too for the teacher to take ownership over um, 
their own learning with regards to using the AASP and how to use it with the student. I think a lot of times as teachers we tend to rely on the paraeducator quite a bit to use that technology. So, um, and I know we have, as teachers we're so busy in the daytime with many, many things, but I think that is also just as important. That's, that's one of those things where you would, I want to bring in the parent and the student and to get, a, you know, a two-hour block where this is before school starts, let's get you familiar so we're not hunting and pecking right away out of out of the gate um, mm -hmm. and so that the teacher knows that, oh, the student does more than, hey, can you just find me the picture of your book? Like, no, the student is going to tell you about his book instead. Right, right, yeah, exactly. Good, thanks, Renee. Did you have anything to add to that or any slides that you wanted to share or? Uh, no. <laughs> no. No. Okay. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna blast right through this. We're going back to Beth though. Okay. Beth, Excellent. Beth disappears though because we, we have her her little picture. I'm thinking Beth has disappeared right now. I'll try okay. connecting with her in the meantime. Let's hear from Shelby. Oh, okay. Beth. Oh, there she is. I'm again. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, Beth. Well, we've got you. It's okay. your turn. You're up. All right, I am, um, here's my notes. All right, my person that I have is a fidgety student who, I can't remember the exact description, but basically they're pretty much on grade level, but they're not having very much luck with their peers or they really desperately want to be with their peers and um, can't find any good connections. So the first thing I think since we are at the beginning of the year, I want to share an idea from one of the professors that I work with. So I work with um, at UC Davis in the School of Ed, and I, this idea is from Nadine Ruiz. as you, you guys probably all know it. But basically, you write down a prompt that you want the whole class to, to respond. After you do that, you crumple it up so your fidgety student could be in charge of crumpling all those papers. And you crumple it up into snowballs is what we call them. And then you stand in a circle and you throw those snowballs into the center. And then you take this, the, any paper out, as long as it's not yours, and every person in that circle stands up and then reads res with respect and quietness their one hope and dream, but it's not theirs. It's whoever was in the snowball. So by building a community of what your hopes and dreams are for ninth grade in an anonymous way, it can really help that person and other kids who are on the sidelines be a part of a class. So maybe your hope and dream is to make one good friend or to find somebody to eat lunch with or to participate in an after-school activity you've never done before or be part of the yearbook or do get an A in the class. Whatever it is, just by saying it out loud in an anonymous way, it will make some connections for the student. Mm -hmm. So as far as for frigidiness, you know, we can obviously use fidgets, which most teachers know about. Um, those are like physical things you can buy through online things, or you can just create your own, you know, a squeeze ball or something like that. You can have the student chew gum. You can have the student chomp on beef jerky. <laughs> then they will stop talking. Um, <laughs> you can... You can give them some physical um, options also. For instance, hey, I know he has trouble, you know, 20 minutes into class, so he will always be my person who takes my attendance down or whatever. So you're giving that person a physical break in a very um, non-isolating way. Um, as far as making social connections, I love and I really would love to encourage teachers, even if it's out of your comfort zone, to make a class blog. Um, and if you put if you put one student in charge once a week, that fidgety student could be the person, the photographer. They could be the person who has an inspirational quote. You can use their interests. Let's say it's they're super into baseball. Well, it's World Series time, and they are the expert on baseball. Um, they could you could have a class Instagram account, which is super cool. Um, that would be a way that, to build connections with classmates or obviously Twitter accounts. We're fans of Twitter, so you could do a Twitter account. Um, also, I just want to say for kids who are fidgety, 
Um, I mean, most of us are fidgety. It's hard to stay still, and our world requires us to stay still way longer than is necessary. So if you can build in as a teacher brain breaks for your whole class, you will be helping that fidgety student, but you're helping everybody. And if you don't know about brain breaks, just Google them. They're super cool. Go Noodle um, is an uh, online option that a lot of teachers use, but um, that will help you create kind of an opportunity to get the fidget out, but you're not pointing to one student. I, I like the fact that uh, we are also addressing students who may not necessarily have outward needs, but are also introverts as well and mm -hmm. are not uh, demonstrative in their, their likes, dislikes, abilities. Those are students that we need to keep in mind as well and bringing out this, those ones that are a bit shyer or perhaps a bit more reserved, um, conscious, you know, so yeah. how, how can we draw those into the classroom environment as well? Does anybody have anything to add on to Beth's before we move on? So I'm going to start writing with what, my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one other thing I want to say is also because I live in California, always keeping in mind that second language learner. So yeah. they are not, um, you know, definitely don't have a disability often, but they do are very reticent to speak and reticent to kind of share their ideas because of their self-consciousness with their language acquisition. So anything we can do to support a second language learner will support our kids with disabilities too. And so looking, if you guys have a certain child with a disability, look to second language learner options and best practices too, and that will help. Yeah, that's great. Good, thank you, Beth. And now we're going to move on to Shelly. Shelly, you've got um, several different students that, that you were going to address, and we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi, Shelly. Okay, so I'm going to actually just zoom in on one student um, just for the sake of time and so I can really kind of take you through their story, but I'm also going to show you some slides. So let's see if this works. I'm going to share my screen. Let's see if this works. Yes? Can you see me? Can you see my slides? Mm, yes. 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 Yeah? Not yet. No? No. It's just I see you though, Shelly. This is my funny face. Okay, let me try again. Share screen. Start screen share. Oh, yes. here we go. Wow, look at that. We there we go, yeah? Yay. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So, hi everybody, I'm Shelly, and uh, so the student that I'm actually going to focus on is based on kind of a project that I did in my home school district, and so uh, this is um, a Math 8 class um, at a local school district. Um, my home school district is the Richmond School District in, in British Columbia, and their school district 38, um, and kind of what we do every year in our district is we have kind of these inclusion projects, and so schools can apply, and then every year we choose between kind of 8 and 10 and facilitate them through kind of a collaborative inquiry process and I'm the facilitator of those groups and so I'm going to show you an example of one group that I worked with because it's a, I think it's um, a really great example of what um, what I hear everybody here on this panel is kind of trying to talk about. Um, so the planning team that came together was the classroom teacher, the educational assistant, the resource support teacher and then there was a district math consultant and then myself which was the district support consultant. Um, this team was given some extra funding for this kind of collaboration and prep um, and then, like I said, there was about eight to ten schools that were a part of it. Um, this particular class was at a high school. Um, the student that we're focusing on is Jessica. She's 13 years old with Down syndrome, and she was included in a Math 8 class with her peers. The question that this planning team really had was, you know, a lot of times students are, are included either socially, emotionally, or physically, but you know, the teacher was like, I totally want to include her in the learning community, but we just don't know how. And so we really zoomed in on how we could include her intellectually in the learning community, but also uh, make that, because the cognitive gap just gets bigger as kids go through school. And so really trying to make it so we can close that cognitive gap between her and her peers in a way that was manageable for the team and for Jessica as well. Um, the goals that the team came up with was the biggest one was so much in inclusive education is around retrofit does, retrofit kind of supports and what we, we really wanted to focus on was design. How can we design inclusion for Jessica and her peers from the beginning rather than trying to do it after the fact because that is where the money is spent. That's where, that's where we run out of supports and funding. So it was really looking at how can we do this from the beginning. Um, 
another goal was start rather than doing something different for Jessica, we're like, why don't we start from access for everybody and then build on complexity so that it's not something that's different that Jessica's doing, but a starting point for everybody. Um, keeping in mind that some kids are going to move further on in complexity, our really our other goal was we're all going to start together as a class and we're all going to end together as a class. And then what it kind of looked like in the middle was different for everybody. Um, and then the last goal we had was to really look at Jessica as a member of the community as a contribution rather than this burden of something that we had to do that was extra, but really bring her as a part of this community. Um, these are the strategies that we focused on. We looked at the inclusion lenses. Um, we looked at universal design for learning, which I think has been mentioned by everybody. We looked at response intervention, the planning pyramid, and specifically lesson design. So I'm going to quickly take you through all of these, keeping in mind that this is like a total whirlwind. I totally get it. Um, but let's look at inclusion lenses first. And so um, how I kind of learned about this was really around when we were advocating for inclusion, what we were finding was that you know kids were getting into classes, but once they were there, um, they didn't really have a goal. There was no really purpose to them being there. And that's kind of how I um, differentiate between integration and inclusion is, you know, integration is just physically there, but you don't really have a purpose or, or, or a reason to be there. And so this is what I like to look at as the inclusion lenses is how do we um, provide purposes within all of the places that these kids are going? Because as adults, we always have a purpose to where we go. And I love to use this example. Um, on Fridays, I do my errands. I always get my car washed. I go to the bank, and I go to the grocery store. But I don't just go to those places physically. Like I go to those places for really specific reasons. Um, I go. I wash my car at the car wash. I get money from the bank. And my joke is I love tater tots, but I'm only allowed to eat them on Saturdays. So I go to the grocery store to get tater tots. But the other part that's important here is I didn't go to the car wash to get tater tots. And so it's really also important to acknowledge that there's specific purposes for specific places. And so we kind of use this idea to be like, well, what are the possible purposes for kids in all of the places that they go? This is what kind of like the literature says in terms of inclusion lenses is that in every purpose or in every place that kids go, there's three possible purposes. And this is not just for kids with disabilities. This is for all kids. This is for all people. So, you know, regardless of the place that you're in, there's always a, a personal a personal purpose, a social purpose, and an intellectual purpose. But the part that's critical here is that so often when we're looking at kids with special needs, we send them away if they're lacking in one of these areas rather than being like, wait a second, these areas cannot be isolate, isolated. They're not compartments. And so how can we focus on all three of these areas together, keeping in mind that this is, this is for all students? And in British Columbia specifically, we've developed core competencies around these three areas because they're recognizing that the curriculum, this is just good curriculum for everybody, not just for kids with special so I think that's really exciting. So in terms of Jessica, this was her plan. And so this is a planning tool that I use with some of my schools. On the left, you'll see the possible places where kids can go. And on the top, you'll see the possible purposes. And so we just zoomed in on one particular area because that that that's where the support was. And so if you look where the star is, um, we focus on a math eight, which is a content classroom, and we focus on her intellectual purpose. So there's many other purposes that we could have focused on for Jessica, but for this particular project, we really looked at how she could intellectually contribute to her to her curricular classroom. So those are the inclusion lenses. Now that's like a whole day in itself. So I so if you have questions, please, please feel free to contact me. Um, the next strategy we looked at was uh, universal design for learning, which is like like Oh my goodness, I love universal design for learning, and this is around my whole research area, so I'm going to show you a little video, which is um, basically like a three-minute thesis that they have for, uh, they had a competition across Canada for students doing their PhD to kind of make a three-minute story of their of their research. And so this is my little video. You may have seen it, but it's only three minutes. But this pretty much like explains everything I believe in in terms of my philosophy of education. So here we go. Oops. Hi, my name is Shelley Moore, and I'm a third-year PhD student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. As Canadians, we have a reputation for finding and embracing the strengths in our diversity. This value, however, hasn't been reflected in our classrooms, which still segregates students by ability, especially students with developmental disabilities. There's a gap in our understanding about what we know inclusive education to be philosophically versus what we understand and the importance of understanding inclusion in our practice. This is the question I'm trying to answer in my research, is how can we find the value in the day-to-day -day practice in our classrooms in terms of inclusive education? So how am I going to explain this to you? Now I can sit here and try and describe this, or we can have a little bit more fun. Why don't we go bowling? So let's talk about bowling. You have 10 pins, you have two balls, and you have a lane. 
The goal is to knock down as many pins as you can. But if you don't get them all, it's okay because you have another chance. But when I bowl and roll the ball down the middle and I don't knock them all down, what often ends up happening to me is that there's two pins left standing on either end and they stare at you. It's the 710 split and it's the hardest shot in bowling. How is bowling like teaching? The ball is the lesson, the pins are the kids. We aim for the middle, we do the best we can. The pins that are left standing, we often have another chance to kind of get to them. But at the end of the day, those two pins that are staring, looking at you, are our kids who need the most support and our kids who need the most challenge. So we end up choosing one and the other one is left standing. I just took all the fun out of bowling. Now, I don't know how many times you've watched professional bowling, but I spent an afternoon watching professional bowling. And let me tell you, there was not one bowler who rolled that ball down the middle of the lane. They threw the ball down the lane at a curve. And I was actually really curious about this, so I called up a professional bowler. He was so excited. I don't think he gets a lot of calls about education. He said the reason why the ball has to enter at a curve is because you will knock down more pins and create a bigger domino effect if you enter at that angle. But in order to do that, you have to change your aim. In order to knock down the most pins with one shot, he aims for the pins that are the hardest to hit. Now let's just let this sink in for a second. We are taught to teach the head pins. We are not taught to teach the kids who are the furthest and the hardest to get to. The kids with autism, the kids with Down syndrome. The part that's critical here, and it really aligns with universal design for learning, is that so often, the supports that we design for those kids on the outside of the lane are actually supports that all of the kids need. This is the part we need to understand if inclusive education is going to move forward in Canada. How can we find this value of diversity in our classrooms between the students? This is not just important for the outside pens, but it's critical for every single one of us. And just think, all we need to do is change. Look how bowling changed education. Okay, so that's the video. So here is the idea, is how do we actually design for the outside pins rather than for the head pin, which is basically like disrupting everything I learned in education. So um, even though I'm working with teachers who totally like are jumping on the inclusion bus, they're just like, but how do you how do you teach that way? How do you design for the outside? So this kind of leads us to the next um, planning framework that we looked at, which most most of us are familiar with, which is response intervention. Um, we use it a little bit differently. Um, basically, we use it to, to figure out who our outside pins are. So the students who need the most support are going to be your tier three, and your students who need the most challenge challenge are kind of going to be at the bottom of tier one and so depending on the lens that you look at you want we actually use this to design a unit around this group of students and so um, in this math eight the unit that we were focusing on was shape and space and so Jessica had a cognitive disability and so she's a student that needed the most support um, the students at the very very bottom row of tier one those are students who needed the most challenge and so we wanted to make sure that we planned with kind of those outside pins in mind um, the next the next planning framework we use, which really, really helps us, and this is from the 90s. I love this framework, and this might look familiar, but basically what the planning pyramid helps us to do is when we're looking at our students and the levels of support they need, we also want our goals to align with those levels. So in the planning pyramid, you basically have goals for all. This is, this is goals that are the most accessible that every single person, including Jessica, are going to be able to accomplish. Um, but that's the, we need to also add on complexity. So then we're going to add on goals for more, and then even more goals for those students that need the most challenge. And so I kind of like to, to think in threes because our brain is kind of manage, manages to organize things like that. Um, this is a level of differentiation that gets your outside pins but also makes it as a st series of steps rather than three distinct groups. And so I'm going to show you an example of how we did that. Um, this timeless toy, which you can a a bit get available in America and Canada, um, <laughs> I kind of think of the planning pyramid like this. And so, you know, if you if you remember this, it's, I think it's called the rocker ring or rocker stack but if you remember playing this the ring that you put on first is the red one because it's the biggest it's the most accessible and then if you start from red and add on rings the hardest ring or the most complex is your purple ring that's the hardest because you have to be the most accurate it's the smallest hole and so if you do it in the right order everyone can fit but if we look at this in terms of education and we think about well if we aim for the middle and start with green well you can add on complexity but you can't go back and add on the red 
the orange or the yellow ring. And so I, I always make jokes about this um, when we teach this way. We're like, oh, okay, so the, the educational assistant can take the red, um, the orange can go to the resource teacher, and let's just hope that the yellow ring doesn't show up that day. Like we're running out of resources <laughs> to go backwards. And so, you know, everyone can fit. We don't have to send kids away, but we have to start in the right place. And so we have to make sure that there's goals for kids that are, need the most access um, to be successful and then add on complexity, add on complexity, because even the kids who need the most complex goals still also need to learn the red goals or the goals that are most accessible because we're building on that's the foundation. Um, so for this math unit, for example, this is the this is the big picture. Um, so on the left hand side, basically we designed um, the topics of each lesson. So in this particular unit, there is two, four, six eight, nine mm -hmm. lessons altogether. And so we wanted to think about our lessons in terms of these rings or this planning pyramid. So in terms of vocabulary, what are goals that everybody can meet and how are we adding on complexity? The access goal that you see on um, right to the left of the all, this is the goal that we designed specifically for Jessica. This was not a different goal, this was just a more accessible goal for the goal for all. So I'm going to show you a really overwhelming chart now, but don't worry because I'm going to talk you through it. But basically after an afternoon of planning, we did it. So we looked, we sat down as the team and we said, okay, on the left hand side is our topics. We went and said, what is the most essential, the red ring that everyone needs to be able to accomplish and that's our minimally meeting or our all. Adding on complexity is the most and adding on the most complex for every lesson is the few. And then we went and said, okay, well what does this look like for Jessica? And the reason why this is really critical is because nothing then in the day when teaching came did we have to say, What's Jessica going to do? But we knew from the start, and that was one of our goals, is how can we design our teaching with Jessica in mind so that at any moment in time we know what her goal is intellectually within that learning community. But what was really important, though, is that that access goal now became the starting point for every single person in that class. And I know Beth was talking about English language learners. This was critical for them. Um, you know, the Pacific Rim, we have lots of, ki lots of people who are immigrating to North America, and so it's really important to consider these English language learners. And so having that access goal, it was so clear that it benefited more than just Jessica. So just to zoom in, I'm going to show you just one lesson. Um, so we looked at kind of the vocabulary for this one lesson, and you can kind of see we all started with access. And so we looked at shapes, and this was designed specifically for Jessica. And then we added on complexity, so these are the new vocabulary, added on complexity, even more complex vocabulary, and the few. I think typically what we do is we're like, here's all the vocabulary, and then kids' success are based on deficits of what they know. This way, it's based on what they do know rather than what, what they don't know. So this was a really Really handy planning framework for everybody. Um, the the last piece of strategy that we use is called lesson design. Um, this is a framework that was developed from uh, Faye Brownlee and Leighton Schnellert, and they basically took UDL and they made it in terms of a lesson, and so they divided every lesson into three kind of phases, and so starting all lessons with connecting, this is kind of your activating prior knowledge, connecting to interests, you know, kind of like your hook. Um, the next phase is processing, this is where you're presenting new information to kids, um, and then they have to do something with it to process, and then the last one is, is how is how are kids showing you that they know it but in their own way and you can see this really aligns with universal design because this is where the choice comes in where kids get to decide how they show you what they know um, and it really exactly um, what we were saying earlier about you know what is the actual goal you're measuring if you're measuring a reading goal then give kids more choice around how they express it rather than forcing them to write so here's the lesson that we're doing is shape and space we have three activities starting with connect adding on process and transform. And so I'm just going to show you kind of what that looked like. Our connect lesson, this is a great strategy that I learned from an SLP that I used to work with, Vicki Rostein. But this is a great way to start um, kind of any unit, but especially when you're introducing vocabulary because this is errorless. Everybody in the class was given a set of vocabulary and all they had to do was sort them into these are words I know and these are words I know. We gave them the words, thinking, starting from an access, so the top row here is what we designed for Jessica, and then we added on complexity. So you can see the next row is, is drawings, and then the next row has no drawings. And so everybody started with the colors, and then once they were ready, they added on the drawings, and then once they were ready, they had a whole set of, of um, vocabulary where they had to draw. So you can see, like, we started from 
a place where no one couldn't do it, and then kids decided how far they wanted to take the complexity. Um, after they sorted, they had a processing, and this is where the kids actually drew in the vocabulary words that they didn't know, and so they could use the internet, they could use each other, but they had to come up with a conceptual drawing. So you can see, like, this is very, very little of me talking, and more about them constructing this meaning themselves, which is really where we're trying to drive our learners. The last part was the students had to choose two of their words and connect them together to make a true statement. This was basically a way for us to formatively assess where they were. Were they pairing words? What level of words were they pairing? Were they accurately paired? Um, they had to put put their words on a post-it note and that was their exit slip to leave the room. And so you can see like this this took about a day and a half to do but we wanted to make sure we went through all of those phases um, for all of the kids. But I want to kind of show you what this looked like for Jessica. Jessica, this top row was designed for her, those, those first, the first shapes, and so she started there, but she stayed there, like that's what she did, so she went into more depth in those areas, and so you can see her activity was, after she sorted, her, her job was to kind of go in deeper into understanding what these shapes were, and so she started with sorting into um, a matching activity, and then she did kind of a word matching activity, um, but the other students can you guys tell me about this one? also did that too, and so you can see... They also, if you look in the top right-hand corner of this video, they had the same words that Jody did. So it wasn't that, or Jessica. Jessica didn't have to do something that was different. Everyone started together. But you can see they added on complexity by actually starting to draw their own kind of images. Um, this is... At the end, then, we also wanted to end together. And so just like everybody else had to connect two vocabulary words, so did Jessica. And so her version of this was we gave her picture symbols to choose from where she had to identify a rectangle is a, uh, and then she could choose from the options which one was accurate. So we were also assessing her understanding of that transference but also that connection to the real world. Um, the one thing I want to tell you about this, this is really cute, Jessica took this activity back to her resource support room um, and it was the end of lunch and four kids came to the math teacher and asked if they could have the same activity because they thought it was so amazing. So it just was really cool because she was able to do this um, very easily, her peers were able to help her, her EA knew exactly what to do, she didn't have to scramble in the moment um, and it, it also showed the other kids how capable she was, right? Because she was engaging in a task that they were engaging in too. So I think it was a really cool opportunity for the kids to really start learning from each other. Um, I'm going to show you a couple resources that I used. Uh, this is the It's All About Thinking series by Faye Brownlee, uh, Leighton Schnellert, and then a few different authors that they've worked with. But all of the examples that they share in these books are around universal design for learning, but around those three lesson phases of Connect, Process, Transform. And so these are great, great, great books um, that I encourage uh, uh, you to look into. Um, the other ones, some other resources, I have a blog that has all of my videos, including the bowling video, handouts, just updates I have that is a great place to go, but also anything that I design for, or I work with teams to design for kids, I put them up on my Learn Some More blog. So these are example units, lesson plans, very, very much the strategies that we're talking about today, modified materials. Um, this is my new book that has just come out that kind of is talking about the rationale about this, and then there's a few more books here that I really are my go-to text in terms of inclusion and learning and kind of this idea of design rather than retrofit. Awesome. Okay, that's all for me. <laughs> Thank you, Shelley. <laughs> that that's was a wonderful whirlwind, I, I, I can acknowledge. No, no, that is amazing information. I was just thinking as I was sitting here listening to all of you share your strategies and your tips and your experience and your advice, how I would have loved to have had this resource, this webinar, 25 years oh, ago when I was... Yes. <laughs> Just starting out with a classroom full of students. It's so true. And, uh, brand new teachers, so new to inclusion. So thank you so much. Before uh, we close off today, can we just backtrack a bit? And Renee, I don't know if you have the slides ready for the contact information, but maybe we can go through each person and just review where they can be contacted and uh, if they have a resource that they want to share. Are you able to pull those up for us? I'm going right now. Yay. I'm on the spot. I am. Okay, yeah, I think we at the end. So. There's. So we have Antonia. Oh, we will go back. We will go back. There we go. There you go. So if you want to find me on Twitter, it's at Antonia Herson. 
and the blog that I haven't updated in a very long time, but maybe this will encourage me to do it again, um, is spedblog.com. That was there's still I still keep it up so that you can get the information that's on there. You're welcome to take a look at that. And are we able to pull that up again, Renee, just very quickly? What am I supposed to be pulling up? Because I, I, I'm, I'm blind to what, what, what uh, other than what I'm looking at the, the slides. Perfect. Okay, and we've got Beth. Beth, where can people contact you? Okay, I'm on Facebook at the National Catholic Board on Full Inclusion. Uh, Our group is all about. Oh, am I, am I off again? Here you are. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, find me at Inclusion Chick on Instagram or Twitter, and we have a Facebook page, and um, or find me at UC Davis, because that's my day job. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. And uh, Renee, where can we find you? Uh, I am at Paraeducate on Twitter. Uh, we are also on Facebook. Our primary website is paraeducate.com. Um, we're getting ready in two weeks. We return with our annual blog for the academic school year, blog.paraeducate.com. Awesome. And then, of course, you can find Shelly at uh, her blog, which is blogsamore.com or yeah. my Twitter is tweetsamore. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And if our audience has any questions or comments, just general things, uh, you can fire them off to me at theinclusiveclass.com or on my Facebook page, The Inclusive Class, and myself or one of our presenters can get back to you. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening and thank you for joining in. Um, always a pleasure to talk inclusion and uh, thank you for, for joining us. Goodbye Thanks, everybody. Bye, thank, everybody. You. thank you guys. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.